So till now, today, we have been talking about the position of the esophagus, which is behind the trachea. And uh, we said that there's the esophagus does not release any enzyme. Instead, it just creates a wave-like movement. It just creates a wave-like movement to push the bolus, to push the bolus. So if it creates a wave-like movement, so always remember that whenever we talk about the movement, whenever we talk about the movement, the movement is only possible when the muscles are around. The movement in the body is only possible where the muscles are located, which means that if the, uh, if the food is moving, if the food is moving, it definitely means that it has some sort of muscles. It is being pushed by some sort of muscles. Being pushed by some sort of muscles. So there must be some muscles in the esophagus. Now, I would like you to know, obviously, uh, we have a very clear picture uh, in the chapter ahead. but. I'll take this very picture to the Jamboard so we can discuss that how this would function. Okay, now this is the picture. And if you want to know this particular uh, canal has two kinds of muscles. One kind of muscles are uh, arranged along the length. Suppose that this is the this is the esophagus. This is the esophagus, and there are some muscles which are arranged along the length of the esophagus, which basically means that it is hollow from inside. It is hollow from inside, but in the wall of esophagus, these muscles are arranged in uh, along the length. These types of muscles are named as the longitudinal muscles longitudinal muscles these are called as longitudinal muscles which are uh, uh, arranged along the length then it comes to the other type of the muscles and the other type of the muscles are arranged in the circular manner like this in a circular way. These muscles that are arranged in circles are called as circular muscles. So two kinds of muscles are there. One are called as longitudinal muscles and the others are called as circular muscles. Okay, what are the functions of these muscles? Before that, I would like you to tell me what is the general principle of mus muscle working um, what do muscles often do what do they often do I understand what you mean by that uh like, like what 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 do they do what what is the function of a muscle supporting movement okay anything else like contract what is the relaxation yes contraction movement. and relaxation yes contraction and relaxation and basically, 
contraction and relaxation have their own meaning. Suppose that if there is a muscle that is arranged in this way, and you say that this is the relaxed form, this is the relaxed form of a muscle, then the contracted form of the same muscle would appear like this. It would be a bit thicken, a bit thicken and like this. This is the contracted form. A bit swollen, shorter form is called as the uh, thicker form. So basically, this is the contracted form. And uh, it means that these two muscles, I'm um, sorry, these two shapes are interchangeable. Like they, they can easily change themselves. That is why they are called as, uh, one, one form is relaxed form and another one is contracted form. If, suppose that if an object is located at this end of the muscle, if an object A is located at this end of the muscle after contraction, the same object A would come, would be, uh, it would be pulled away from its location to another location due to contraction. You getting it? Yes. Similarly, there is a particular type of muscles now, the circular muscles. Now, this is basically an example. The example belongs to a longitudinal muscle. Longitudinal muscle. A circular muscle's relaxed form looks like this. But when it contracts, it becomes shorter. This is the contracted form. Suppose that if, if there is a duct, if there is a duct that has like this kind of appearance then after the contraction of the circular muscle it would become like this it would become like this now this is the location where the circular muscle is contracted now you must remember that when it comes to esophagus when it comes to esophagus, the esophagus seems to be creating the movements like these. It has been noticed that the esophagus creates these movements. And this is the bolus. This is the location of the bolus. Now, when the scientists closely watched, they came to know that the region of the esophagus that has been swollen, the region of the esophagus that has been swollen, it is due to the longitudinal muscles contraction. Longitudinal muscles are contracting and they are converting the they are converting the straight esophagus into this balloon shaped or swollen form it was straight it was straight in shape exact straight in shape but it suddenly converted into some parts which are squeezed and some parts which are swollen why because every part that is swollen the longitudinal muscles are contracting causing the uh, the swelling or the expansion of the muscle and at the same side the cir circular muscles need to relax need to relax similarly at the site where you can see that the muscles uh, or the esophagus is being squeezed it is because the circular muscles in this particular position, circular muscles are contracting and longitudinals are relaxing. Longitudinals are relaxing.
So that is basically the phenomena of the uh, that is basically the phenomena of the circular muscles contracting, longitudinal muscles are relaxing, and this movement, this wave-like movement, is called as the peristalsis. This uh, movement is called. Did you understand the involvement of the muscles? Sorry, repeat that, please. I didn't get that. Did you understand the involvement sentence. of the muscles? Yeah, yeah, I do. Just have a look at the next chapter. Just look at this. These uh, th these diagrams are basically showing the move, uh, the shape of the muscles the circular muscles and the uh, longitudinal muscles now you can see that this is the region where the circular muscles are contracting leading to the uh, the contracted form or squeezed form of esophagus and the circular muscles uh, uh, and the longitudinal muscles are contracting here where they are making the space for the uh, for the bolus remember that the longitudinal muscles they work to make the space for make the space for the bolus while the circular muscles they contract they contract from the beginning beginning to the end of esophagus end of esophagus to the end of esophagus uh, pushing the bolus so basically this kind of movement this wave like movement in this particular movement all the muscles are working in you can say uh, in harmony to push the bolus towards the stomach and remember that if the esophagus looks like this if the esophagus looks like this then remember that both the muscles in this position are relaxing both type of muscles types of muscles are relaxing Got it? Yes. So you can see it over here. And once the food reaches the stomach, now another very important thing, and that concept I'll explain first, then I'll tell you that where do these things look at. There is a very important word called a sphincter. Sphincter is the set of muscles. It is a set of muscles uh, that can open or close any uh, they ca that can open or close the entry or exit of any organ of any organ suppose that this is the wall of an organ this is the wall of esophagus suppose and these are those muscles they are arranged like this they are arranged like this in this form they are relaxed but when they would contract they would just okay no uh, hold on i can make their shape a bit different to make you understand these are relaxed right now but when they would contract when they would contract they would appear like this they would appear like this like it is a bit less space but they would create the space between them 
now they are contracted and the space would be made between them would be created between them from where the bolus can easily slip into the stomach we have many walls in our uh, in our uh, you can say esophagus uh, not many but this region uh, let me mark it the region common between the trachea and the esophagus this region is called as the pharynx and in the very beginning we have a sphincter in the very beginning we have a sphincter here like this and this basically is called as uh, uh, i guess pharyngeal esophageal sphincter pharyngeal esophageal sphincter or maybe esophageal sphincter you don't need to uh, remember the name then come uh, then uh, another sphincter comes at the end of the at the end of the esophagus which basically uh, controls you can say that uh, the last sphincter basically controls this is called basically called as the cardiac sphincter because it is very close to the location of heart it is called as cardiac sphincter it controls the entry of bolus into stomach of bolus into stomach like if i literally mention it it looks like this so uh, this uh, this particular sphincter is located here it is located here and when the bolus reaches here this is the bolus and the bolus reaches here it would just simply open open by contracting once it contracts it open and the bolus would pass into the stomach this is called as the cardiac sphincter you can just simply mention it cardiac sphincter clear yeah then the next one is now the food would enter into stomach remember that initial part of the stomach is if i properly mention it this initial part of the stomach is called as the fundus we don't really need to know that for the exam but this is the region where all the gases accumulate the gases that are being produced by the being produced by the uh, uh, by the stomach would accumulate here they would accumulate here and the rest of the stomach is rest of the stomach is like this now look at the stomach this is the this is the stomach and basically the stomach is not a simple organ always remember you see that the, we we studied the uh, longitudinal and the uh, circular muscles in the esophagus what is the uh, what is what are the muscles are they um, are they organ or are they tissues the muscles are tissues right yes uh, and we also need to know that if we need to understand the uh, the function of an organ we need to know about the tissues just like when we need to know about a tissue we need to know that what kind of cells are located in it similarly an organ would be properly understood when we know about the tissues uh, present in it the stomach generally if we just uh discuss the overlying concept then the stomach generally comprises of these tissues 
Uh, first is epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is basically responsible. We also call it glandular epithelium. Did I tell you that the most functions of an organ would be done by the epithelial layer? Did I explain the epithelial tissue that. ever? I think mm. you did mention it. Yeah. Epithelial tissue is one of the most important tissue in the sense that it basically performs the functions of a, on an organ. It does not have the role in the structure, but the functions of an organ. So one kind of epithelial tissue is called as glandular epithelium. And glandular literally means that they would secrete something. Secrete something. So three kinds of cells would be located in the glandular epithelium. One is called as mucus. Second are uh, second type of cells would release the hydrochloric acid, and a third type would be released in the pepsin. And they all have different names. They all have different names. Okay, pylodic, okay, time. They all have different names. Um, but we don't need to know the names of them. That what are the names of these cells? Glandular epithelium as a whole. The other, uh, the other type of epithelium is just, uh, you can say, endothelium. Endothelium means that this would be making the inner lining of the stomach. If you see it closely, this part, which is, uh, this part, which is show, showing some curves, it is going to be called as endothelium, endothelium. And then the other tissues that would be located, let me uh, make you understand that what is the meaning of the endothelium. Suppose that this is the stomach. This is the upper part of the stomach. And inside there is layer. And you just open one small portion from here. You take one small portion. This is the, now the layer, the overall, overall this layer is endothelium. Inner layer of stomach. But yes, you will see some pores here, which are generally called as gastric pits. Gastric pits. And these pits are basically, they are penetrating deep inside the stomach. And they have the glandular cells. These are these pits basically represent the glandular tissue. In this, we have glandular cells. So every uh, uh, everything, whether it is mucus, whether it is mucus or HCL or uh, pepsin, would come into the stomach with the help of the pits. You getting it? They would be entering into the stomach yeah. with the help of the pits. Yeah. So once uh, the other type of tissue that you would find in the stomach are the muscular tissue. Remember that the muscular tissue is uh, responsible for a particular movement of the stomach called as churning. Churning. Churning is responsible for grinding and mixing. So this also comes in the physical digestion, as I have already told you. And the muscular tissue, you will find the same kinds of muscles. It is not in your syllabus. But you can see the circular and longitudinal muscles are there, but there are some other muscles, oblique muscles. So muscle uh, would make the stomach move in all directions. That is the 
um, oh, then you will find the nerve nervous tissue and you would also find the blood vessels all kinds of tissues would almost to almost be located inside the stomach one thing as i have already told you churning is is important for the physical digestion physical but if we talk about the hcl or pepsin hcl is a very strong acid and it is responsible for two things one antimicrobial activity meaning that it is going to be basically breaking uh, basically uh, killing the pathogens that would enter with the help of your food and second along with that it would be helping in breaking the breaking the bonds in the food breaking the bonds in the food so always remember that the HCL does affect your food. It does affect. Most people say that HCL does not affect. No, it, it is basically, you, you should also remember, this is also physical digestion. Although it is being, uh, it, is, it is like um, done by the HCL, but it also comes in the physical digestion. Why? Because it would just break the food, the major bonds of food, converting it into smaller parts. So the same principle as the physical digestion. So yes, it, it would also come in the physical digestion. What? The breakdown of the food by the HCL. Got it? Yeah. OK. So next is the pepsin. Now, pepsin, basically, it is released in an inactive stage and what do we call inactive uh, uh, in an inactive form what do we call that form did we use inert no 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 that form is called as pepsinogen pepsin is pepsin gen is forming it is a form that would that it is a uh, a shape that would convert into pepsin and it is also done by the hcl hcl would be responsible for the conversion of pepsinogen into the pepsin and the ph must be 2.0 and what kind of enzyme the pepsin is the pepsin is a protease what is the meaning of a protease Um, it breaks from proteins, right? Mm. Once the protein is being acted by the protease or the pepsin, most of the time the protein converts into the polypeptides. Into the polypeptides. But sometimes, if you eat a very small, simple protein, it would be just converting from the polypeptide into the amino acids but it rarely occurs most of the time the pepsin would be converting into the polypeptides would be converting the protein into the polypeptides understood yeah so your product mostly once the food is out of your stomach is the polypeptide any other thing you want to um, okay do you want to have a look at the um, whole thing about the stomach that we have discussed? I know it's fine. Okay. So, one. Yes. So this is the. Now we are about to enter into a very important thing, and that is the that is the small intestine. <clears throat> uh, 
<clears throat> the small intestine is a part of the the small intestine is a part of the uh, of the digestive system in which um first of all always remember by the name of intestine we have two organs one is called as small and the other one is called as large remember that with respect to length the small intestine is lengthier the large intestine is shorter but with respect to diameter it is much uh, it is much less but the large intestine has a large diameter that is why that is the reason we call it the large intestine not because of the length so moving ahead when the large intestine uh, sorry when the small intestine reaches the small intestine is almost of the size of uh, i would generally say it is almost of the size like i guess 15 feet maybe it is almost 15 feet so what do you do we we basically make the con convolutions what is the meaning of convolutions the convolution means folding we fold our small intestine so that we can uh, fit it into the available space and second it does not perform does not perform only one function only one function instead it has multiple functions so if i properly tell you from here uh, oh no sorry sorry one thing i forgot once the food is treated in the stomach food or bolus is treated it quits the stomach through pyloric sphincter pyloric refers to the intestinal end uh, which was the previous one um previous one the sphincter uh, at the very beginning of the stomach what was its name um was it lower esophageal no 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 pyloric sphincter pyloric is the one that is closer to the small intestine the one that is closer to this heart is called as the cardiac sphincter or maybe at the very beginning of the stomach which is closest to the heart that is the uh, that is the cardiac sphincter understood yeah so the uh, in the very beginning it is the cardiac sphincter and uh, in the very at the very end of the stomach that is called as the pyloric sphincter so once the pyloric sphincter is reached the food is named as not now it would not be named as bolus it would now be called as chyme and books often call it as the acidic chyme acidic means because it has been treated by the acid of the stomach so that is why it is called as the acidic chyme it 
it is called as the acidic khan clear yeah yeah because it's been treated by the uh, by the stomach acid so it would be called as the acidic kind so now the chyme at this location your food particle would be called as the chyme and th these are these are basically the uh, pyloric sphincter this is the pyloric sphincter and now the very next part of the or the very next part or the very first part of the small intestine would start now uh, as i have told you the small intestine is almost 15 feet so it is often divided by it is often divided on the basis of the uh, functions. The very first and very small part of the stomach from here to here, this part is called as the duodenum. And almost right from this end to this end, this region is called as the jejunum and from here till the end of the small intestine because here the large intestine starts so from here till here this part is called as ileum so the duodenum what are the functions? Why are we dividing them by name? Remember that the duodenum has the functions function of receiving. Receiving. What does it receive? It receives the chyme from stomach. It receives the bile from gallbladder. gallbladder and it receives the pancreatic juice from pancreas so all the secretions are being released into the duodenum that is why into, they're all being released into the duodenum into the duodenum okay. chyme coming from the stomach obviously acidic chyme the pancreatic juice, the bile juice, or both of them are being received by the <clears throat> by the duodenum. Another thing I forgot to tell you previously that the collection of these three, the collection of these three, it is called as the gastric juice. It is called as the gastric juice. The bile is called as the bile juice and the pancreas, pancreatic juice is another juice. And it, these are called the, as juices because they are being, um, you can say that they are being uh, controlled by, they are, sorry, they, they are the mixtures of the, enzymes. Okay, so finger is all right. <clears throat> Over here, I would like you to show one very important thing in this. Have a look at this. Um, I'll like to zoom it. See, this is the liver, the darker one. This is the liver. And liver actually, it makes the bile. It makes the bile. What basically is the bile? Liver makes the bile and stores in gallbladder. Gallbladder. What is the bile? 
<clears throat> the bile is the the bile is a collection of different things some cholesterol molecules it is it contains salts and it contains the bilirubin what is the bilirubin and sometimes it also contains the uric acid bilirubin is basically the waste product waste or byproduct of hemoglobin breakdown waste or byproduct of the hemoglobin break the hemoglobin breaks why the hemoglobin breaks can you tell me um i'm not sure why it would break any particular any fluke no i don't, I don't know okay basically the hemoglobin breaks because our red blood cells uh, have a life of 120 days they have a life of 120 days and uh, um, the red blood cells uh, once they break the hemoglobin inside them is also broken it is also broken down so uh, like we can say that once the hemoglobin breaks down we the bilirubin is made and bilirubin is a toxin toxin extremely dangerous thing remember that if this bilirubin accumulates into your uh, blood it causes the jaundice causes the jaundice if accumulates if accumulates so in hepatitis a in hepatitis A, the uh, the bilirubin is released into your uh, bloodstream, and the color of the bilirubin. Guess what's the color of the bilirubin? Uh, red. No. Hemoglobin is red. What happens in hepatitis A? What color? Uh, what, uh, it's yellow, uh, right? Uh, yeah. It's the eyes yellow. become yellow yes 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 the color of the stool is because of the same reason the bilirubin is released through the stool just give me uh, a few seconds okay so Cholesterol, salts, bilirubin, uric acid, and some more things which we don't need to know. The most important part that we need to know is the salts. What are the salts doing here? The salts inside the bile, you can notice that there are no enzymes here. no enzymes here you don't need enzymes basically another thing sorry I forgot to mention one of the most important thing and that is the mucus mucus is also released by the bile okay so basically what happens there are no enzymes what are the uses of salts salts are used to emulsify the fats what is the Emulsification. Emulsification is conversion of large globule of fat into smaller globules, smaller globules that can fit into active site. active sites just like that you can say this is the large globule and once you 
use the salts, it would be converting into very small globules. A globule is a spherical body of something. You can see it over here. This is a large fat globule. Once the bile is coming, the salts, or you can see that this large fat has been converted into smaller globules. That is the purpose of the salts inside the bile. Got it? Okay, yeah, I'm sure. Okay, uh, remember that the duodenum only received the bile. The rest of the process is not occurring in the duodenum. This process basically occurring in the jejunum. You have to remember this. The duodenum is only receiving. So although it is not understand and to differentiate between the functions, we need to know that this process majorly occurs inside the jejunum. Got it? Yeah. Now, once uh, this, the function of the other thing, the mucus, the mucus actually neutralizes the acid coming with the chyme. If you remember, what is the pH of that acid that is coming with the chyme? Uh, the exact pH. Mm -hmm. um, that is coming with the chyme. Approximately 2, right? Yes. Approximately 2. So if this particular chyme would enter into the, uh, into the intestine, it would just dissolve it. It would just destroy it. <clears throat> So once it would destroy it, it would be lethal. Similarly, when the stomach is uh, when the stomach is being uh, the stomach is releasing the chyme, the chyme would be immediately neutralized by the uh, mucus coming not only from the bile but also from the pancreatic juice. Remember that the second thing that is, that is putting its fluid into the duodenum is the pancreas. This is the leaf-like thing is a pancreas, this one. The leaf-like appearance is the pancreas. And the pancreas basically releases the pancreatic juice. Pancreatic juice. And this pancreatic juice contains different enzymes like the amylase, like it contained the lipase, it contained very important enzyme called as trypsinogen. This is an inactive form. Remember that there is a conventional rule for enzymes. Non-protease enzymes, the enzymes which are not working as protease, they would always be ending in A's. The enzymes which are proteases, they would always be ending in the suffix in. Pepsin, trypsin. So it means that trypsinogen. Trypsinogen is basically inactive form. And this would become active when it would enter into the small intestine. Along with this, the pa pancreas would also include the, include the mucus. The most important point that you need to know here is that the pancreatic juice and the bile juice, they both would combine into, into the uh, into a duct called as bile duct, which would simply open into the duodenum. It would simply open into the duodenum. You can see from this picture that this particular thing is the bile duct. Can you see? The, can you look at the bile duct? 
Uh, yeah, I can see it. So both of the organs are releasing their secretions into the bile duct, which are ending into the duodenum. So now, ultimately, uh, one more thing, uh, bile, bile duct, everything is here. OK, the story does not end here. The story does not end here. Uh, always remember one more thing, that this amylase that is being re released by the pancreas, it is called as pancreatic amylase. Why do we need to mention that this amylase is the pancreatic amylase? Because we have studied one amylase that is released in another part of the body. What that amylase is, where that amylase is released? Uh, in the salivary glands? Yeah, the so that would be called as the salivary amylase. So this one is the pancreatic amylase. Similarly, the lipase is called as the pancreatic lipase. Why? Because the lipase is also present there in the intestine. The intestine has its own juice. That is why. So all of these would be entering into the duodenum and they would be functioning in the jejunum. They would be functioning in the jejunum. Another thing that occurs in the jejunum, now we are talking about the jejunum. Another juice that is called as the intestinal juice. Now this particular juice contains some other enzymes. I'll, I can show you <clears throat> this one. Enterokinase, erepsin, maltase, sucrose, lactase, intestinal lipase. All these are. Uh, all these can be located, and these this juice is called as in the intestinal intestinal juice. That is totally an exclusive separate juice. So there are four juices: gastric bile, pancreatic, and intestinal. One more thing I needed to tell you that uh, I said that the liver made makes the bile, stored in the gallbladder, and the gallbladder is a particular pouch. It is a contractile pouch. What is the meaning of it? It can contract. Upon the proper signal, it would contract and it would release its secretion into the, into the duodenum. So uh, it would just simply release its secretions into the duodenum, and then all of them are going to work together. The intestinal juice would be containing some enzymes. And also, one more thing you need to know, intestinal juice has two types of enzymes. One enzymes are free enzymes, free enzymes in the solution. And the other types of enzymes are, uh, Stick, they stick to the membrane. These enzymes are called as immobilized enzymes. They stick to the membrane of cells. And they easily perform the digestion while sticking to the membrane. So that is the very, that is a very particular important point to know. Some of these are sticking to the membrane. Now, uh, the names of the enzymes are uh, mentioned over here over here and the small intestine what is it happening what it's uh, what is happening but these are very less very less enzymes are mentioned so you can see it from here just uh, just take a quick gaze on the collection of enzymes at work Okay. Done. So this is how the enzymes generally work. And the in the end, what did I say? I said that the purpose of what is the purpose of digestion? The purpose of digestion is to convert the food into such smaller parts that can into such smaller parts that can 
be rebuilt into larger molecules. Like we basically eat the macromolecules, the larger molecules, and we break them to the smallest unit. We break them to the smallest unit. That is the purpose. So all we get in the end are these. What? Without digestion. But in the end, after digestion, what do we get? Glucose or monosaccharides? Monosaccharides, um, amino acids, amino acids, and monoglycerides, monoglycerides, and fatty acids, and fatty acids. These are the products that we get in the end of the digestion. Now these can be easily absorbed. The digestion procedure that we decided that the procedure in which we need to, we basically need to uh, break down our food, that procedure is now finished. You can hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I'm on mute. Okay. I, uh, I am, I'll send you this slide, but along with this, you need to uh, see this table as well, because uh, this table is also things are well. Okay, so now the very next part is absorption. Since we are still in the small intestine, remember that absorption occurs in the third part of the small intestine. And that is the ileum. Ileum. Ileum is the last part of the small intestine. And okay, what is necessary for absorption? Can you tell me? Necessary for absorption, like in general. Given that, given that all the absorption is done by the cells is necessary for absorption something that could be absorbed like i don't um, what? i do not explain um, like something okay that needs to be absorbed like in the first place if you need to if you need to transfer if you need to transfer something across the cell if you need to transfer something across the cell then what uh, what do you think do you need to transfer something uh, in the cell or out of the cell uh diffusion mm. try telling me that what is basically involved in transfer Um, so what, like, it's diffusion, right? Hello? Hello? Can't hear you. Uh, 
Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Basically, the thing that is required in the transfer is the uh, the thing that is required in the transfer is the cell membrane. The cell membranes, we need a lot of cell membranes. Why? Because absorption is done by the cells. Because absorption is done by the cells. Done by the cells. So that is what we need to know. That when it comes to the absorption, we need more and more and more cells. Okay. So now this means that if we need a lot of uh, cells, uh, then it also means it also means that uh, we need a lot of surface area. Because you know that the surface area is involved with the cells and cell membranes. We need a lot of surface area so that we can absorb as much food as we can. Is it clear? Yeah. So what do we do? We, when it comes to the ileum, we do not just suppose that you are looking at the ileum from outside. You are looking at the ileum from outside and you take a longitudinal section of the ileum. What is the longitudinal section? Like the name? Uh, sorry? You mean the name in the ileum? No, no, no. What is this uh, section? What the is section in? Section, section. Longitudinal section or sectioning means we are going to cut the organ. Yeah, so the longitudinal section, that's what I said. Yes. So basically, the longitudinal section, we, we take the longitudinal section. And when we take the longitudinal section, we come to know that the intestine is not as simple as it seems from outside. No, it's not, it's not as much simple. Instead, it has very strange foldings on the inner side. Very strange foldings on the inner, inner side. On both sides, it has very strange foldings. These are just finger-like foldings. And one fold is called as a villus, or collectively, these foldings are called as villi. These are called as villi. Collectively, these foldings are called as villi. Getting it? Yeah. Now, this is dramatically increasing the surface area. Suppose one surface is like this, and on the and the other surface, you are just making it like this, converting the same surface into this. Which surface is longer? Um, the one with the um, uh, not the, the first one. Sorry, the second one. Because Second one means you if you stretch it out, it will have more exactly, surface area. Exactly. If we stretch it, it would have more surface area. So clearly it has more surface area. But if we the next thing is if right now we are just looking at the tissue, you know, the tissue layer. This is a tissue layer. When we magnify the same tissue layer. We know very well that the tissues are composed of what? Cells. 
cells. So it means that there must be the cells lining at the at the boundary of the tissue. The boundary of the tissue, and these are the cells. These are the cells that are lining it. And these cells, if you open up these cells and you magnify them, you will come to know that these are not simple cells. Instead, all these cells have the cell membranes like this. They also have some finger like things, and these foldings, these further foldings are called as micro. Will I? Further foldings are called as microvilli. So first you folded the tissue, the tissue layer. Then you expanded, then you magnified the tissue, and you saw that the tissue is lined by the cells. And when you opened and magnified the same cells, you came to know that cells are not having the flared cell membrane. Instead, these membranes are also folded just like the villi, so you named them microvilli. Now, can you imagine how much larger the surface area would be? The yeah. surface area is equal to the area of a tennis court. Yeah. Or area of tennis court because first the intestine is folded. Intestine is folded. Second, you have folds inside the ileum, which are villi. Then each villus is having a lot of cells, and each cell ha is having a lots and lots of finger-like projections, which are microvilli. So it has a very, very large surface area. That is what we call as the microvilli, and this is the surface area in which our food would absorb.